All right. Hopefully, everyone can see my screen. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode three, Migrate and Optimize SAP S4 HANA on AWS. And we really appreciate everyone taking the time out from the busy schedules to attend today's uh, session. With over 5,000 SAP customers already running on AWS, what we are seeing is that the pace of SAP migrations to AWS continues to accelerate at a rapid clip. In fact, we saw more than a 20% year-on-year increase in ERP migrations in 2020. Every step along the way, you can leverage AWS's years of experience to build your organizational, operational, and technical capabilities so that you can gain business benefits faster. My name is Rosal Singh, and I'm a senior solutions architect for SAP on AWS. I'm part of the worldwide sales organization team here at AWS, and in my current role, I help customers architect their SAP workloads on AWS with SAP and AWS's best practices. I come with more than 15 years of SAP basis consulting experience with expertise on SAP installations, upgrades, and migrations, both on-premises as well as cloud. Today, I'm also joined by my colleagues uh, Sunil, Raj, and Bidwan, who will help me out in answering any of your questions in the chat. Now, the only bad question is an unasked one. So keeping that in mind, please feel free to post any questions, any queries that you might have. And if you're not able to address your questions now, we will definitely follow up with you later. Now, all good things start with an agenda. So let's take a look at it. In this episode, we will cover prerequisites for this particular episode three, which is migrate and optimize your SAP S4 HANA system on AWS. For some reason, if you were not able to attend the previous episodes, uh, which were held uh, from uh, Monday till Tuesday, yesterday was another session, episode two, all about architecting and deploying your S4 HANA on AWS. Episode one was all about creating that secure landscape. If for some reason you were not able to attend those episodes, uh, that should still be OK. However, I highly recommend going through those uh, sessions or the episodes once the on-demand recordings are available to you. Next, uh, we will take a look at AWS accelerators for SAP migration. Uh, homogeneous and heterogeneous migrations, operations and management for SAP workloads. Uh, we, we'll talk a bit more on um, DevOps for SAP in this particular section. And then we will wrap up with some of the AWS differentiators when it comes to running your SAP workloads on AWS. All right, let's uh, begin with the prerequisites. As I mentioned before, episode one was all about creating a secure foundation for SAP S4 HANA on AWS. And episode two was all about architecting and deploying your SAP S4 HANA on AWS. And by now, what uh, as a logical step, your target AWS systems are ready and you're ready to migrate those systems from on-premises or any other source environment to AWS. All right, uh, just so that you can, you guys can focus on the slide deck, I'm gonna turn my camera off uh, so that we get more real estate as far as uh, the screen is concerned and uh, so that you're able to see the slide deck better. All right, before we start with any migration to AWS, there are a few key questions that you need to ask prior to your migration. The first question is, are the planned software and the OS versions compatible with AWS? Now, I've highlighted this note here, which is SAP note 1656099. I would recommend everyone to go through this note if you're planning your migration to AWS, which gives you an overview of what all SAP application versions, operating system, database uh, servers uh, that are supported on AWS. The next question, how large is the database that is being migrated? Are we looking at a small or a medium-sized database? Are we looking at a large database, which could be in terabytes, or a very large database, which could be 25 terabytes or 50 terabytes? Are we looking at that domains? Because that will define your strategy, and it ultimately boils down to what's your business appetite for downtime as well. Another question, 
that you need to ask prior to any migration is what are the other systems that are dependent with this system and how are they accessed? We have seen customers take a piecemeal approach where they're first moving their SAP ECC systems to AWS, or it could be a SAP S4 HANA Greenfield implementation, and they still have their legacy systems on premises. Right, so it could be a central finance implementation where the data is being replicated from the on-premises legacy systems to that central finance S4 HANA system on AWS. So what are these dependent systems? How do you take care of the network connectivity between these uh, systems? Do you need a VPN or a direct connect connection? Will it be a real-time replication or will it be a bad job based uh, replication that is happening behind the scenes? So all those things have to be considered. And then what is the usable speed on your network connection to AWS? Now, we've seen scenarios where customers are already running their non-SAP workloads on AWS. So now when they are bringing in their SAP workloads and during the migration, is that a bandwidth available for that migration, for that data transfer? So you could have a one gig pipe between your source and the AWS region using a direct connect connection, which is a dedicated line between that source environment and the AWS region. But is all that bandwidth available for your migration? Will there be a contention of uh, resources when it comes to network connectivity? So all those things have to be considered as well. Next, uh, we take a look at homogenous migration, which basically means lift and shift, rehosting your platform from your source environment, and you're basically finding a new home on the AWS world for your existing SAP workloads. So you're keeping the same operating system, same SAP software versions, and the database software version uh, is also the same uh, on the source and the target. So that in that uh, respect, that becomes a homogeneous migration in the SAP world, right? And then when we talk about heterogeneous migration, is there an operating system platform change? Is there a software version change or database platform change, especially when we talk about S4 HANA conversions? So there is a change in, there could be a change in the operating system. So there's definitely a change in the software version because you could be migrating from an SAP ECC to S4 HANA. And then of course you could be running it on any other database than HANA on the source system. And then you're planning to do an S4 HANA conversion. So there's a change in the database platform. So in the SAP world, we call it a heterogeneous migration. Now, there are a lot of ways, different ways to get to AWS for SAP customers. In addition to selecting the right migration approach from all the options, there is one common denominator where our AWS services play a key role. Our provisioning tools, such as AWS Launch Visit for SAP, or it could be your custom cloud formation templates, uh, which you or your partners have built. And that can help you quickly deploy your target infrastructure on AWS. With AWS Launch Visit for SAP, our customers are able to deploy production-ready, highly available S4 HANA systems in less than two hours. The other differentiator in all of these migration approaches is our services to move data from on-premises to cloud. Most commonly used service in all of these approaches is Amazon S3, which is simple storage service, which is our object storage service available at your disposal. Customers use S3 to copy their on-prem exported or backed up data and store in S3, which will be readily available to import or restore into the target environment on AWS. Storage gateway. Uh, AWS Data Sync and Snowball are some other great services that you can make use of uh, to transfer your data securely and effectively. Now, Cloud Endure, uh, which is now called as Application Migration Service. So that's a new name given to uh, this particular service. Uh, but behind the scenes, it's the same Cloud Endure technology that we've been using. And we'll take a look at uh, this particular tool in depth. And uh, I have a demo on this as well. So this is one of our other service for migration as well, which fits very well for lift and shift scenarios for our SAP customers to provide that end-to-end -end framework. Next, uh, let's do a deep dive on some of the AWS accelerators for SAP migration. So first, we look at Amazon S3. 
So I'll focus on the top two sections that you see on your screen on this particular slide where you've got ECC on HANA, you are doing an S4 HANA conversion or a S4 HANA upgrade in, in this respect, and then you have the flexibility to use Amazon S3 to move your backups to the target environment. And then also the second scenario is HANA replatforming, where you're using software update manager and there's a feature within the software update manager called database migration option with system move as one of the options. So if you're using that uh, and if you're familiar with SAP uh, and, and if you come from that basis background, you know that there will be export files that will be created on the source environment. So how do we move those files, those export files from my on-premises environment or the source environment to the target. And that is where Amazon S3, uh, specifically the multi-part upload and using the AWS CLI comes into play. So data uploaded to Amazon S3 is stored as objects in containers called buckets and identified as keys. Right? So they are identified by keys. Buckets are associated with an AWS region and each bucket is identified with a globally unique name. The AWS CLI, the command line interface, is an open source, fully supported, unified tool that provides a consistent interface for interacting with all parts of AWS, including Amazon S3. Now, there are two pieces of functionality built into the AWS CLI for Amazon S3 tool that help make large transfers. Uh, so in this case, we are talking about your export files, or it could be your backup files if you're considering a homogenous migration. So that helps you make these transfers into Amazon S3 go as quickly as possible. And there are two aspects to it. First, if the files are over a certain size, the AWS CLI automatically breaks the files into smaller parts and uploads them in parallel. Now, this is done to improve performance and to minimize impact due to network errors. Once all the parts are uploaded, Amazon S3 assembles them into a single object. Now, the second important functionality that uh, AWS CLI for Amazon S3 provides is that it automatically uses up to 10 threads to upload files or parts to Amazon S3, which can dramatically speed up the upload. So multi-part uploads allow you to upload a single object as a set of parts. Each part is a contiguous portion of the object's data, and you can upload these objects parts independently and in any order. If transmission of any part fails, you can retransmit that part as well without affecting the other parts. Once all the parts are uploaded to S3, S3 will assemble them and create the object. In general, when your object reaches 100 megabytes, you should consider using multi-part uploads instead of uploading the object in a single operation. So by doing this, you get improved throughput, quick recovery from any network issues, pause and resume your object uploads, and you can begin and upload before you know the final object size, which means you can upload an object as you're creating it. So I've talked about Amazon S3, uh, the multi-part upload using uh, AWS CLI. So let's see it in action, right? So I have a demo here, pre-recorded demo. So let's go through it. So I'm in my AWS console right now, I'm in the North Virginia region, which is my source environment. And I'm running an SAP EHP8 enhancement package 8 system running on an ASC database. Right. So now, as a next step, I need to run my export process. So if you're familiar with this, I'm basically doing an SWPM export. I'm creating those export files uh, using the SWPM tool. And once it has created my export files, right? Once my export is successful, now I'm logged into my source system and using the AWS CLI, I'm basically issuing a command, which is AWS S3 CP, which, is, which stands for copy. And then I'm doing a recursive so that it reads, it's able to read all my files, subfolders and the files in those subfolders. And 
then this is my target location in an S3 bucket, which is uh, SAP system export bucket. And this bucket is in the Oregon region. So I'm basically simulating an on-premises environment in the North Virginia region and my target AWS region where I need to export the system to for this particular migration is the Oregon region uh, in AWS. So once I've issued this command, now the copy process starts. So let's look at those export files. So here we can see we're looking at all the export files that the SWPM tool has created. So we're looking at an um, 87 gig of data that has to be exported from on-premises to the AWS side of the things in the Oregon region in that particular S3 bucket. I'm gonna move ahead here. So now I talked about threads, right? It has the parallelism inbuilt. So these are the number of open connections. And using the else of command, I'm able to capture the number of open connections on port 443. So there's nothing else running on the system right now except my uh, copy command. And while the copy command is running, uh, so this demonstrates basically the parallelism. Now you can fine tune this, you can increase the threads that you want if you want uh, parallel, parallelism at a higher level so that you can increase your data throughput, right? And once I've uh, done this and we're seeing that there are 10 parallel threads which are working for this particular S3 command, let's check the CPU load on my source system. So using the mstat command, I can easily check the load on my CPU. And here we will see that the system is not seriously stressed given the sizes involved. So we are moving 87 gig of export files to Amazon S3 in the Oregon region. So overall the CPU is 80% idle. We do not see much IO wait times, much of a user activity as well. So we can assume that almost all of the CPU time is spent running on the AWS CLI command. All right, let's quickly move forward and uh, let's see the number of files that it has imported so far uh, into Amazon S3. So using the AWS S3 LS, which is the list command. So you can see so far it was able to move 423 files. And let's quickly check our bucket in the Oregon region, which is my SAP system export bucket. And in the data folder, I can see all the files being moved. All right, so let's see how much time it takes. Now you see that the, my copy command has uh, been executed and it took 10 minutes and 31 seconds. So this is the real or the wall clock time. And uh, it took 10 minutes and 31 seconds to move my export files from North Virginia to Oregon uh, using the multi-part upload, which is built in automatically, right? Now, finally, once my export is finished, I can see there were uh, 1,078 files that were moved. So this was the count of the source SWPM export files. And let's quickly check how many files were moved to my S3 bucket. So as you can see, again, I use the same command, AWS S3 LS. And I can see that there are, it's the same number of files that were moved to my S3 bucket as well. Now, another thing I talked about was the multi-part upload where it splits the files into various, into multiple parts uh, to increase the data transfer speed. So let's check that, whether it did that or not. So using the AWS S3 API, command and using the head object as one of the parameters. So I'm checking this particular file, baldat.001, because this is uh, where my data resides in those export files, right? So in that, I see this E tag, and E tag is an opaque identifier, and there's a dash here. And after that dash, if you see a number, that means it was, it 
it, it was able to split this particular file into multiple parts to increase my data transfer. So that's how that's how powerful the tool is when it comes to using AWS uh, S3 multi-part upload. All right, so if I had to do, do a summary, we moved 87 gig files to Amazon S3 in 10 parallel streams. The operation took 10 minutes and 31 seconds, and this represents an aggregate data rate of 138 megabytes per second. So this was all about Amazon S3 multi-part upload. Let's move on to the next accelerator, which is AWS Storage Gateway. So again, this is applicable for two of your, two of the top scenarios that you see on the slide, ECC on HANA, uh, where you could be moving those backups from on-premises to AWS or HANA re-platform, where you're moving your export files from on-premises to AWS. So what is Storage Gateway? Storage Gateway is a hybrid cloud storage service that gives you on-premises access to virtually unlimited cloud storage. This could be a virtual appliance installed in your on-premises data center that helps you replicate files, block storage, or tape libraries by integrating with AWS storage services such as Amazon S3. And by using protocols like NFS, Network File System, or Internet Small Computer System, uh, system Interface, with popularly known as iSCSI. AWS Storage Gateway offers file-based, volume-based, and tape-based storage solutions. For SAP systems, we will focus on file replication using a file gateway. For scenarios where multiple backups or logs need to be continuously copied to AWS, you can copy these files to a locally mounted storage, and they will be replicated to AWS. All right, so I have a demo on this one as well. So let's quickly go through the demo. Again, my architecture is the same. I have a source HANA database, uh, which is running in the North Virginia region. I'm simulating an on-premises environment. And then my target region on the AWS is uh, Oregon. So architecture is the same, just that my source database is now HANA database. And what we will do is we will present this S3 bucket as an NFS mount point on my source database using AWS Storage Gateway File Gateway. All right, so let's move ahead with the demo. So I'm logged on to my AWS console. I go to AWS Storage Gateway and I select File Gateway. I click on Next. And here you get the option to select the host platform. So as you can see, we give you various options because in the end, it's a storage appliance uh, and meant for a hybrid approach, right? So in that case, we give you the option of VMware, Microsoft Hyper-V. It could be a Linux-based, uh, kernel-based virtualization machine as well, or it could be a hardware appliance which you can directly purchase from amazon.com and ship to your data center. And then you just plug it into your data center and start using it after all the configurations are, are done. So in this case, since I'm within the realms of AWS world, so in that case, I'm using Amazon EC2 as my storage gateway appliance. Right, so now we selected EC2, click on next, and here I'm using a VPC endpoint, which basically means that my connect connections do not traverse the internet, but they are riding our private network backbone within the AWS. So I given my VPC endpoint so that my source instance is able to connect to this particular VPC endpoint. And then I'll give in the IP address of the storage gateway, which I've uh, created. So as I can see, I'm using an R5N 12X large instance for my storage gateway. I type in the IP address and click on connect to gateway. And then it gives you other options such as uh, a gateway time zone, gateway name, and then tags as well. Always, always a best practice to configure tags for your resources 
that are being deployed on AWS. So tags are nothing but a key value pair. Here in this case, I'm defining a key, which is name and a value storage gateway. And what's the purpose? Uh, so we are basically taking HANA database backups, right? Uh, but then you can define additional tags as well based on your cost centers and um, uh, for what environment are you considering? Is it prod, dev, QA, right? So you can have additional tags based on your requirements. Now, once I've selected everything, click on Activate Gateway, and then it gives you an option to configure the local disks, so which is my cache storage. And this is the uh, most frequently accessed data, which is kept in the cache storage of the storage gateway, file gateway uh, sto appliance. And in this case, it's EC2. So I'm configuring my local disks. And once I've done with it, uh, I'll create Gateway Health Group, basically to monitor using CloudWatch. And CloudWatch is our AWS native service, which is used for monitoring your environment. So once I've, I'm done with that, let, let's go ahead and uh, check what we have configured. So we have a storage gateway up and running. The status is running. Uh, so the tags have been defined. The monitoring data, it will be uh, shown as graphs, uh, which is nothing but uh, our CloudWatch service. And as you can see in the monitoring data, you get all the metrics uh, that are being defined. So client traffic, cloud traffic, um, cache percent dirty, and cache percent hit. So this is basically related to your local cache volumes that you've stored. Next, it's time to create the file share, right? Because as I mentioned before, we are creating an NFS mount point, but in the back end, it's nothing but an S3 bucket. So we are presenting that S3 bucket as an NFS mount point to my source system. So let's go ahead and configure the file sharing settings. So here we define the S3 bucket that I've created. So this has been created in the Oregon region, and uh, we'll use that bucket to store our HANA database backups. So this is my bucket name, storage gateway HANA back is my bucket name. So let's go ahead and configure that in the file gateway in the file share settings. And we'll define an S3 prefix name as well for it. All right, so once I've defined that, we'll be using NFS. And uh, then again, a best practice, to always use tags. So once I've uh, defined my tags, let's click on Next. And here you get an option to select the storage class for the new objects, uh, which could be S3 standard. It could be intelligent here, standard, infrequently accessed, or one zone infrequently accessed as well. But in this case, we are just sticking with S3 standard. Now, once I've reviewed all my parameters, click on Create File Share. And once the file share is created, we are ready to mount this on our source HANA database, which is running in the North Virginia region. So it gives you the commands to mount your NFS mount point, which uh, is basically pointing to the S3 bucket. And here I've uh, logged on to my HANA source database. And what I'll do is create a directory, a create a file system for SAP HANA backup, and then update the ETC FS tab entry, and then mount it. All right, so once I've uh, updated that, the ETC FS tab entry, now it's, it's time to mount. All right, so we're done with the mount process now. And we can see simple DF minus H, we can see that my file share is mounted. And let's take a backup of uh, the HANA database. So once you trigger that backup, you should see you should be able to see that your backups are, uh, are 
basically getting populated in my file system and then they should also be replicated to s3 asynchronously behind the scenes so this is a very small database uh, so the backup should not take much time so uh, it finished already and what we need to check is whether my backups were moved successfully to my S3 bucket or not. Uh, so in this case, first I took the system da uh, database backup, and then now I'm also taking a tenant database backup as well. All right, that should not take much time because it's a very small database. All right, once that is done, now let's check our file system, whether those backup files uh, are there for the system as well as the tenant database. All right, so the, my backups have been moved successfully. At least that's, that's what I see in the file system, right? But whether they've moved to S3 or not, let's check that as well. So I'm in my S3 bucket, which is in the Oregon region, and I've got my SAP HANA backup, uh, and then let's see if those backups have been moved or not. So let's do a quick refresh, and you should be able to see the backup. So there you go. So we were successfully able to move uh, the backups from my source environment, which is in the North Virginia region, to an S3 bucket in Oregon, which was presented as an NFS mount point using storage gateway, file gateway. So here's my tenant database backups as well. And that's how you can move those backups uh, from your on-premises environment, especially when we're talking about homogenous migrations. So these could be your HANA database backups or Oracle database backups or any other database that SAP supports, right? So you can take this approach as well. Another use case of storage gateway file gateway is, uh, as I mentioned before, it's a hybrid cloud storage service. Uh, so you can take those older backups and archive them on S3 and then also use S3 infrequently access storage tier to save on costs there as well. That's another use case of storage gateway. All right, so next uh, we'll take a look at uh, another accelerator that we have, which is AWS Data Sync. Now you can use AWS Data Sync to migrate SAP data to Amazon S3. Amazon EFS, which is Elastic File System, which is a shared storage service that we have highly available. It's a regional service with four nines of availability when it comes to SLAs. And also you can use AWS Data Sync to migrate that SAP data to Amazon FSx for Windows File Server as well. So you can configure Data Sync to make an initial copy of your entire data set and schedule subsequent incremental transfers of changing data until the final cutover from on-premises to AWS. Data Sync includes encryption and integrity validation to help make sure your data arrives securely, intact, and it's ready to use. To minimize impact on uh, workloads uh, that rely on your network connection, you can schedule your migration to run during off hours or limit the amount of network bandwidth that DataSync uses by configuring the built-in bandwidth throttling. So that's another neat feature of AWS DataSync where you can configure that bandwidth throttling as well. DataSync preserves metadata between storage systems that have similar metadata structures enabling a smooth transition of uh, end users and applications to using your, aid, uh, using your target AWS storage service. So you can use AWS Data Sync to copy NFS file systems, uh, specifically if you're using it for, let's say, USR SAP Trans, or if you're using it for your interfaces directory, right? which is a common scenario that uh, you'll find in the SAP world where your ECC or your S4 HANA system is tightly integrated with uh, various third-party interfaces. So that is where AWS Data Sync can come in handy to copy that data from the NFS file systems uh, from the old to the new SAP accounts and mount it on respective instances as well. 
All right, so I have a demo on data sync as well. Uh, so let's quickly go through that. Uh, I'm using the same source system as you saw in the Amazon S3 multipart upload. And there I have, uh, I had an SAP EHP 8 enhancement packet H8 uh, system running on AC database in my North Virginia region. And uh, what I've also done is uh, I've created an EFS file share and I've mounted this on my EC2 instance. So the EFS file share is SWPM export. Uh, if you're looking to do an SWPM export, uh, something I don't recommend using NFS, uh, always stick with local volumes. Uh, but if you are in a situation where you are using NFS uh, file system to export that data, then you do have the option to use AWS data sync. So in that case, uh, EFS file system is my shared storage system. Uh, this is a shared storage service, which is mounted on my source EC2 instance. And what I will do next is basically ensure that my EFS is mounted correctly on my EC2 instance. So as we can see, my mount is there. And now the next step will be to run that SWPM export process. Of course, if you're using uh, DM of sum, uh, that will also create your export file so you can use AWS data sync in that scenario as well. All right, as a next step, let's go to the data sync service. And what I've done is I've basically created tasks. Uh, so task is nothing but defining your source and the target location. Uh, so since, again, I'm, I'm in the AWS world, uh, I do not need an AWS data sync agent, but if you're coming from on-premises and if you're coming from any other source environment, then in that case, you do need a data sync agent to be installed, which sits near your uh, NFS server, and then that can be used to move those files from AWS to on-premises, uh, from on-premises to AWS. But in this case, uh, I've simply defined my source and the target location. Uh, and my target is in the Oregon region. So I've created an e EFS file system, which is SWPM export underscore target. All right, once we have defined uh, the EFS file share and we've defined the uh, data sync configuration as well, now the next step will be to run my SWPM export. And here I'm running the export on my source system. So I define my EFS file share and then let's continue and you'll see the export process running and you can use migration monitor to monitor the progress so here we've already seen that task has been executed in aws data sync and you can see already it moved 84 files uh, uh, with the data transfer speed of 212 uh, maybe bytes per second, and the data th throughput that you're getting is around five maybe bytes per second. So while my export process is running, my data sync tasks are also running in the backend, which are moving my export files from the source to the target. So the first task was executed successfully, and then I've scheduled basically four tasks uh, which will keep running in the background at every 15th minute of the hour. And it just keeps moving those files in parallel to Amazon EFS file share, which is in my Oregon region. Uh, another thing I wanted to show was, uh, let me do a quick, uh, let me go forward on this particular demo. Uh, and what I wanted to show was it also does, uh, so once it's launching, it comes into that running status and then it also verifies. So it checks the data integrity. And if there is any changes on the source, it does, it is intelligent to pick that up and then ensure that all the files, for all the files, the data integrity is kept and your data is intact. So all these are my export files, which are being moved. All right, so 
this is my last task in the AWS data sync. So it's transferring 20% is done. It gives you that status as well. And then eventually what you should see is in the end, it does a verifying task. So as you can see, the status here is verifying. So now it's it's checking the source and the target, whether the data integrity is intact or not. And on the source, uh, as you can see here, I've got 1057 files which had to be exported and data sync basically should be able to show us, uh, uh, should be able to move the same number of files on my target as well. And how do I check that since it's an EFS file system? So I've uh, basically launched an EC2 instance in the Oregon region. And what I'm doing is mounting my target EFS file system on the source, uh, on the target uh, in the Oregon region uh, so that I can check uh, whether all the files were moved or not. All right, so as you can see, 1057 files were moved uh, by data sync to my target EFS location and my source was also the same. So they, there you have it. So you can use AWS data sync as well if you're looking at that NFS file system data transfer. All right, uh, another accelerator that I wanted to talk about was AWS application migration service. Now, this is a new service, but behind the scenes, it's Cloud Endure. Uh, so something to keep in mind, Cloud, Cloud Endure has been there uh, since few years now, but what we have done is we've created a new service uh, called AWS Migration, Application Migration Service, and the acronym for that is MGN. Uh, so it uses continuous block level replication, and it's highly automated machine conversion and orchestration tool. And this basically simplifies and expedites the migration process, minimizes the cutover windows, and decreases the potential for human error for SAP migrations. So this fits very well for your lift and shift scenarios when you're looking at rehosting. And we'll talk in depth about AWS application migration service in, uh, when we cover the homogenous migration portion. Another accelerator that was covered in yesterday's episode was uh, AWS launch visit for SAP, which can help you build that target environment on AWS quickly and seamlessly and in less than two hours. So we started the journey for automated SAP systems deployment back in 2014 when we introduced AWS Quick Start for HANA. So this was the first automation to install SAP HANA database together with provisioning the EC2 instance and the EBS, the elastic block storage volumes. And Quick Start includes CloudFormation templates that automate the deployment of AWS services and infrastructure as part of the infrastructure as a code standards, right? However, in April 2020, we announced AWS launch visit for SAP, which moved the automation to a, to a completely a new level with new user experience. Uh, so launch visit for SAP is embedded in the AWS console and it's designed for new SAP workloads deployment on AWS or migrate existing on-premises SAP workloads to AWS. So basically when you're setting up that target environment on AWS, Right, especially when you're considering S4 HANA conversions or S4 HANA migrations or a greenfield implementation. That is where AWS Launch Wizard can help you accelerate it, accelerate that process by automating it from soups to nuts. Right, so it includes instance size recommendation, which is based on specific SAP requirements like combination of RAM and vCPUs, or it could be SAPs as well. It also provides the pricing estimation directly in the user interface of the tool. It guides you with correct sizing and provisioning of AWS services for SAP systems based on best practices from thousands of SAP on AWS deployments. And 
it not only deploys the AWS infrastructure, it not only does the SAP installations, but it can also configure your production systems in high availability, leveraging SUSE's or Red Hat's cluster solutions. So basically, everything from soups to nuts, it's able to handle that. And last month in August, we introduced a new feature, which uh, includes integration with AWS Service Catalog for deployment consistency, supporting your CI CD pipelines, your CI CD tools, and direct access to infrastructure as a code to meet custom requirements. Another accelerator is uh, AWS Snowball or Snowball Edge, uh, where basically we send you a physical device. It's shipped to your on-premises data centers. You plug, in, uh, you plug that into your data centers and then transfer the data. It could be your backups. Uh, it could be your export files, right? And then you send it back to us. So you can copy large amounts of SAP data from your on-premises environment to AWS uh, when it's not practical or possible to copy the data over the network. So usually we don't see this often when it comes to migrations, but there have been few edge cases and only few uh, because they, keep in mind there is a lead time when it, when it comes to Snowball. There is... Uh, a shipping process, right? Uh, it could take a couple of days to get to your data center, then you're uploading the data, then you're sending it back. So that data could become stale, but you there are workarounds. So you could store restore your systems using that particular backup, and then you just keep implementing your incremental or your log backups, right? So that's one workaround uh, around this. Uh, this strategy. So it's something to keep in mind when it comes to Snowball. Um, and there have been few cases where customers were moving around 60 terabytes of their um, SAP databases because it, it's basically a, a data mart solution that they were migrating to AWS. So in that respect, in that scenario, the downtime wasn't that important for them. So they leveraged Snowball in that scenario. So few edge cases where we have seen this uh, being used, but for most of them, I would highly recommend it. I would I would highly recommend going with the Amazon S3 uh, multi-part approach, which uh, most often meets the user's requirement, and then start looking at other tools like Storage Gateway or Data Sync. All right, now that we have talked about uh, about all the accelerators. Uh, that we have. Uh, so we talked about Amazon S3, multi-part upload, AWS data sync, uh, Snowball, storage gateway, uh, launch visit for SAP to build your target environment. Let's talk about homogenous migrations. So first we will talk about backup and restore. So with homogenous migrations, uh, you provision your SAP database and landscape on AWS manually, or it could be using launch visit for SAP, or it could be using your custom cloud formation templates. So if you're using launch visit for SAP, that means uh, you're already on HANA database and launch visit can help you expedite and automate that process of building that target environment on AWS. Now, as a next step, you're ready to transfer those backups either using um, uh, AWS uh, S3 CLI, it could be storage gateway, and then uh, it could be any other open source tools as well, like uh, rsync, or it could be SFTP and uh, making sure uh, that you transfer any necessary logs for point in time recovery as well. So that has to be kept in mind uh, when you're doing a full backup and restore, or it could be a full backup that you're restoring after completely shutting your systems down during the migration. And then as a next step, you recover your SAP database, install your SAP application servers, and depending on your application architecture, uh, you might need to reconnect your applications to the newly migrated SAP database, right? So that is where all the uh, additional activities come into play when we talk about uh, migration, where it could be uh, DNS-related uh, activities, Active Directory-related activities, or it could be uh, even your interfaces that you need to account for. 
Next, uh, this is uh, another approach that uh, we've seen uh, and, and we highly recommend is homogenous migration and using incremental backup and restore, which can drastically reduce your business downtime. So I'll start off from the left uh, where day minus 11 is where you build your production instance on AWS. Um, now, this could be, again, using Launch Wizard for SAP, or you're building it manually, or you have your custom cloud formation templates, or it could be templates built on Terraform as well, or uh, any other infrastructure as a code tool. And then day minus five is where you restore your full backup, and you're transferring that backup either using AWS S3 CLI, and then you're using, uh, it could be using Storage Gateway, and then day minus four is where you start implementing those Delta backups, right? And day minus one is again, when you're restoring that uh, last but one Delta backup. And on day zero, on the day of cutover is where you are restoring that last Delta backup or your log backups. So with this strategy, you can drastically reduce your business downtime, especially if you are considering very large databases, right? Next, uh, we talk about homogenous migration using HANA system replication. Uh, so instead of doing a backup restore, now you're relying on SAP native features, uh, which SAP HANA database provides, which is HANA system uh, replication. So you are provisioning your SAP HANA system and landscape on AWS Again, using Launch Wizard for SAP. Uh, it could be your custom cloud formation scripts as well. And then to save on costs, uh, this, this is another tip. Uh, to save on costs, you might choose to stand up a smaller EC2 instance type. And then on the day of the cutover, you can resize it to the actual or the right sized instance that you need based on your peak utilization, right? So there's, and that resizing happens within a few minutes. You gracefully bring the system down after you're done with the takeover, and then you resize it using the AWS console or using AWS CLI, and then you bring the HANA systems back up. So in this case, uh, when we are considering on-premises to AWS, you establish an asynchronous SAP HANA system replication from source database to your standby SAP HANA database on AWS. And then eventually you'll perform an SAP HANA takeover on your standby database, install your SAP applications to servers. You can skip this step if you used uh, SAP launch visit for SAP. Uh, AWS launch visit for SAP, right? And then again, depending on the application architecture, you might need to reconnect your applications to the newly migrated SAP HANA system. Again, involving your DNS uh, changes, your AD changes, or it could be related to interfaces as well. Next, uh, we take a look at homogenous migration and using CDP tools, uh, which are known as continuous data protection tools. Uh, so if you are interested in using the rehosting option, which basically means lift and shift for your on-premises SAP environments, you can also leverage continuous data protection tools such as uh, Cloud Endure, which is now called as Application Migration Service, uh, Delphix, ATA, ATA data, and then double take as well. These are some of the popular tools that we've seen, uh, which replicate the on-premises, virtual machine, physical servers, and databases on AWS. These tools, they provide an automated way to build your AWS environment and migrate your source environment as is to AWS, including retaining the host names and the operating system configuration as well. Now these tools are application agnostic and operate at the operating system level and storage level. Now there may be additional configuration steps needed to ensure that your SAP systems are running in the most optimized manner. So one such tool that we have, we as an AWS, we have an, uh, in our arsenal is AWS Application Migration Service previously called as Cloud Endure. So I might uh, use these uh, two uh, terms interchangeably. Uh, so let's dive into application migration service. Uh, so using continuous block level replication and highly automated machine conversion and orchestration. So this service simplifies and expedites the migration process. It minimizes the cutover windows and decreases 
the potential for human error for SAP migrations. So it's designed to perform large scale migration projects uh, with minimal performance impact. And if I talk about this flexibility, uh, it basically allows you to migrate from any source and a lightweight agent can be deployed on the source machine as long as it's running on a supported x86 operating system. Uh, so which basically means all of the common Windows and Linux operating systems are supported. And once the agent is deployed on the source machine, whether it's physical, virtual, or cloud-based, we will replicate it into AWS without any disruption. Uh, if you're also looking for the ability to migrate back, you know, as a backup option, so such as for regulatory or compliance requirements, because in your if anything during the migration process goes for a toss, if there are any issues, if there are any showstoppers and you need to migrate back, then it can do that for you as well. So continuous data replication, uh, it replicates workloads at the block level. And as soon as the agent is uh, deployed, it detects all the disks which are attached to the machines that are being migrated. And as long as those disks are presented as block devices, it replicates everything in a consistent and predictable fashion. And block level replication means that none of the data gets left behind. So everything moves over, including the machine state, operating system configuration, applications, databases, and files, and everything works at cutover. Uh, and once the planned cutover window arrives, it's done very quickly, typically in minutes, and Cloud India Replication replicates everything in real time. And everything is always up to date, down to the second, so that when you want to perform that cutover, there is no playing catch up or having to replicate the most recent data and wait for that last snapshot to arrive. Uh, Another thing I wanted to talk about Cloud Endure was uh, related to automation. Uh, in terms of additional automation, Cloud Endure, uh, it has a rich set of fully documented RESTful APIs that can be used to either plug into migration factories or cloud centers of uh, excellence. And it has also a pretty neat feature where posts scripts can be launched in order to remove applications, uh, install new applications, and make other system modifications in an automated fashion during the migration tests or cutover. And we'll see that in action. I do have a demo on Cloud and your application migration service as well. So we'll, we'll see it in action later on as well. So when it comes to the supported platforms, so unlike uh, application specific migration solutions uh, cloud and your supports all workloads includes uh, including databases legacy applications or homegrown or custom applications as well so it supports all the common windows linux uh, windows and the linux versions and distribution uh, distributions which are running on x86 architecture and uh, it supports migration from physical data centers vmware hyper v um, and other public clouds as well, such as Azure, GCP, OpenStack, Oracle Cloud, or it could be IBM Cloud as well. And if you have a requirement for migrating a workload from one region of AWS to another, uh, we can support AWS as a, uh, as a source as well. And this is where it comes in handy for a disaster recovery solution as well. So you can basically use Cloud Endure in two flavors, one for the migration, and then once you've successfully migrated, you're looking for a disaster recovery solution for your SAP systems, Cloud Endure can come in handy specifically for your application servers. For HANA databases, we still recommend using SAP HANA system replication. It's DB aware, it's SAP native. It helps you compress those logs and data as well when it's doing that uh, HANA system replication. Um, and also additionally, I wanted to point out that uh, once you're doing a migration using Cloud Endure, for a specific, and uh, I'm talking here about SAP HANA databases, and if you're using Cloud Endure, then since it's working at the block level, it will bring in 
all the configurations, all the disks from the source to the target. Now, on the AWS side of the things, we do have certain recommendations when it comes to storage configuration based on the instance type that you select for your SAP HANA database. Now, taking an example here, let's say you select R5 12x large, uh, 12X large uh, instance type. So that particular instance has a certain storage configuration recommendation, uh, which is supported and certified from AWS and SAP as well. So something to keep in mind, if you're using Cloud Endure for your HANA databases, then there might be some additional activities where you have to reconfigure your disk. So I highly recommend if you're considering homogenous migrations, stick with HANA system application for your data, HANA database, and then for your app servers, you can take that approach of Cloud Endure, bring in into the AWS world using Cloud Endure seamlessly, and then you do your upgrades on top of it because that is where the flexibility of AWS comes into play as well, where you can resize your instance, uh, your app servers, and run that upgrade process right with more horsepower. And then dial it down. So once your migration, your upgrade activity is complete, now you dial it down back to your peak utilization requirements. All right, so this is the architecture. Uh, this is a very high level architecture that illustrates how Cloud Endure migration can deliver rapid, reliable uh, self-service migrations with minimal business uh, disruption. On the left is the source environment, which can be composed of different types of SAP components, such as SAP databases, application servers, or it could be some of the tertiary or the ancillary systems that support the SAP ecosystem. Uh, so the agent is deployed on the source machine uh, without requiring any kind of reboot and without impacting performance in any noticeable way. So that initiates the continuous data replication of the data into AWS. And Cloud Endure provisions a very low cost staging area that helps reduce the cost of cloud infrastructure during replication. So it deploys those replication servers that you see here. So these are lightweight Linux EC2 instances. Now, when it comes to security, and security is, is job zero here at AWS, so it provides a secure mechanism for data replication. Cloud Endure, it replicates data using AES 256-bit encryption in transit. In addition, customers can use their own private connectivity, such as VPN or Direct Connect tunnels to replicate the data privately on top of the encryption as well. And Cloud Endure can leverage EBS encryption on the target site for encryption at rest. So when the data is replicated and lands on AWS, it can land on an encrypted disk uh, that can be using a customer's own customer, uh, custom encryption keys. All right, so now uh, let's take a look at uh, a demo. Again, uh, we have a new service, as I've uh, mentioned before. Now it's called Application Migration Service. And uh, it's all based on Cloud Endure technology. So the demo that you see is uh, on actually using the Cloud Endure console with the new service. Uh, that service is uh, operated and it's within the AWS management console. That's one of the difference that you will see using the new service. However, uh, since this demo was recorded before we launched the service recently, so uh, I'm showing your demo with Cloud Endure console. However, the concept, the logic, the technology remains the same. So in this scenario, I'm creating a uh, Cloud Endure uh, account. And then as a next step, what I need to do is uh, create a project. So this is my SAP migration project. And then let's go ahead and name it as uh, test. And this is a migration project. And once I'm, I've set up the project. And now next is to provide the AWS credentials. And then I'll select the migration source, which is my other infrastructure, and the target region on AWS, which is the Oregon region. And here's uh, where I'm defining my replication settings, uh, whether I'm using uh, SSD-based uh, disks, what are the subnets, uh, and what is the security group uh, within that uh, for that particular um, replication server. And then you have the option to use VPN or Direct Connect, and then you can you do network bandwidth throttling as well. 
So once I'm done with the replication settings, now the next step will be to download the software that is needed for Cloud Endure. So here it gives you all the instructions, the commands to download the Cloud Endure agent installer for Linux. And then later on, we'll see how you can run the installation process. So my installer has been downloaded. And as a next step, what I will do is I will run the installation process. Again, the commands are provided, so you can just simply copy paste. And one thing here to notice is that I'm running this command with no prompt option. So that means Cloud and your agent will basically identify all the disks that are attached to that EC2 instance, and then it will start replicating all those disks. So if you run it without this no prompt option, you do get an option to select the disks as well. All right, so once my Cloud Endure agent has been installed, the next step uh, will be to go to the, uh, will be going to the Cloud Endure console and check if my source machine has been listed there or not. So as you can see, once the agent has been installed, the source machine is uh, listed out here. And then I can start uh, the replication process. It will start automatically uh, within a few minutes. And then uh, I need to define a blueprint. So basically what my target machine will look like. So once I do a cutover or I do a test, op, uh, test cutover, then what should be my target instance type on AWS? So this is where I define my blueprint and all the settings associated with that and the replication settings that we had defined in the project before. All right, so once we have defined the blueprint, uh, it uh, will start doing the replication and here you can see it has started doing the replication and my replication is complete. And this is where I talked about the automation uh, within Cloud Endure or the application migration service where you get the option to launch post-launch scripts. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm defining a new backup volume. I'm also updating my DNS uh, entries, Route 53 entries, and I'm also changing the IP address. So this is all part of my post-launch script. So I don't have to do it manually. The moment it launches the instance, it will pick up that launch script and execute it automatically, right? So that is a pretty neat feature with Cloud Endure or application migration service. All right, so once uh, I've checked the post launch script, my I'm ready to test it out and Cloud Endure gives you the option to test a cutover scenario. So basically you, you can do a test cutover and then on the D-Day, on the day of your migration, uh, which usually happens over, over a weekend, then you can do the actual or the real uh, cutover. So in this case, uh, first what I'll do is in the test mode. So you can do multiple iterations to ensure uh, that your instances are coming up in the right way, your configurations are there. Uh, so that you can test that well in advance before your real migration happens or during the D-Day, right? And uh, next, uh, let's uh, log into my uh, HANA database, which has been launched by Cloud Endure, and then just do an HTTP start, and I can see my database has come up successfully. And then as I mentioned before, on the day of the cutover, you will select cutover mode, and then you can also check the job progress status if everything is going as expected. All right, so my HANA database has come up successfully and everything looks good here. So this is the power of our, uh, Cloud Endure or the application migration service, which you can use to migrate your SAP systems, uh, specifically if you're looking for 
homogeneous migration lift and shift basically uh, next we'll take a look at heterogeneous migration uh, so this is uh, very popular for, uh, with our customers especially when they're considering s4 hana conversion so dmo database migration option with system move enables you to migrate your sap system from your on premises environment to aws by using a dmo feature of some which is software update manager uh, which is basically a special export and import process. It's an SAP native feature. And then you can use AWS native services uh, like Amazon S3, EFS uh, over a direct connect or AWS storage gateway file uh, gateway and uh, data sync as well in case you're doing that export on a shared file system however uh, sap also provides their uh, uh, provides a script within that tool which can uh, which you can definitely uh, leverage and it's a script which is based on rsync so uh, most of you who, who are coming from the sap world might be aware of it already so that's an option as well uh, which uh, you can use uh, and then you can use the AWS launch visit for SAP to rapidly provision the SAP HANA instances and build your SAP application servers on AWS when you're ready to trigger the import process of the DMO tool. The SUM DMO tool can convert data from any database to SAP HANA or ASC uh, with OS migrations, release enhancement pack uh, upgrades as well, and it can do Unicode conversions occurring at the same time. So results are written to flat files, as we saw earlier with our export files, uh, which are transferred to the target SAP HANA system on AWS. And the second phase of DMO uh, with System Move imports the flat files and builds the migrated SAP application with the extracted data code and configuration. All right, uh, now we've talked about uh, DMO of some. Uh, there are partner solutions as well, which are available. One such solution is T-Bone, or Transformation Backbone, which is provided by our partner SNP, which is a German-based uh, company. And uh, one example that I do want to highlight is uh, uh, one of our customers, uh, which moved uh, and which basically did a uh, conversion to uh, AWS, migration to AWS, and to overcome their upgrade and migration challenges, they engaged uh, SNP to assist with the SAP upgrade at the application layer. Uh, now this works on the change recording, which is done, uh, which is activated in the source system. And then they have crawlers and extractors, and they've connected the sender and the receiver system using, uh, it could be, RFC or direct data transfer um, using SFTP as well. And then the target system is built, data transfer, uh, data is transferred from source to target while the source is running. So you're able to achieve that near zero downtime. And in the customer example that I was referring to, so the ERP system was migrated with SNP T-Bone solution, enabling a near zero downtime approach. And uh, using the automated on-premises solution, the migration of uh, SAP ECC 5.0 on, on the AWS cloud was executed simultaneously with the other SAP components in one project that included EHP upgrades, the Unicode conversion as well, re-platforming to Linux with the latest version of the Oracle database and the data migration to AWS cloud. And the go live for this migration took place during the weekend of uh, March uh, 2016, somewhere in that time frame, uh, with a technical downtime of less than four hours. So this was an SAP ECC 5.0 to SAP ECC 6 scenario on Oracle database, but they also support S4 HANA conversions as well, where you plan to uh, have near zero downtime and downtime is of utmost importance and you're looking at maybe a very complex migration scenario uh, where you're running on let's say legacy ECC versions and you're looking for that Unicode conversion as well in case you're running on non-Unicode systems. So this is where these partner solutions can come in very handy. Next option that we have for our customers is, uh, of course, SAP's NZDT solution. So this is a service provided by SAP MDS team, which is a minimized downtime service team. And the sum steps are handled in uptime on a cloned NZDT to reduce the overall business downtime. 
by reducing the technical downtime by using a dedicated hardware for the clone systems. Uh, it triggers uh, installation of the source. Uh, DMIS uh, add-ons uh, are in installed. Uh, so if you're familiar with it, these are basically the SLT add-ons that you see. Right, so those are the similar add-ons that SAP uses. And then the delta replay of data processing is done as well on the target size. So this is how the architecture looks like. And this is one of the customer example where a customer migrated their 25 terabyte uh, Oracle database to S4 HANA. And as you can see on the left-hand side, they had their source uh, ERP EHP 8 Oracle 12.1. And then a clone was set up, uh, which was basically a, the cl clone of the source systems. And then they had migration work bench as well. And then apps over for DMO was run at the source. Uh, network connectivity between the data center and AWS using dedicated line using AWS Direct and Connect. Uh, this was an MCOD deployment, multiple components, one database. And then after the data replay is done, uh, basically the proxy schema would be deleted. Uh, so this is where you see the source. And then apps over for DMO was run on the target. So this is all on the AWS side of the things. And one thing uh, that I would like to point out and recommend is when it comes to running your import processes or you're in this particular scenario. So for the app servers, always consider using a higher sized instance so that you can get more CPU resources more, because all these processes are CPU intensive. So that is where you use flexibility of AWS. Go to a higher sized instance. So if you're considering, let's say, R5 2x large for your application servers, I would highly recommend considering a higher sized instance during this migration or the upgrade uh, process during the import process so that you can significantly reduce the time that it takes to import those files. Right. So these are the partner solutions. So heterogeneous was all about some DMO um, uh, that SAP provides, and then the partner solutions uh, provided by SNP and then SAP NZDT solution. So this was all about migrations. Uh, we covered uh, homogeneous and heterogeneous migrations. And I do want to cover uh, operations and management for SAP workloads for the next uh, five minutes or so before we uh, wrap up. Uh, so it's it all starts with uh, infrastructure provisioning using the tools that you see on the left. Uh, it could be CloudFormation templates. AWS Launch Wizard for SAP is built on CloudFormation. Uh, it could be Terraform as well and few others which are listed down here. All these are great tools around infrastructure as a code. Second layer is using Ansible, Chef, Puppet, or it could be AWS Systems Manager. Uh, using which you can deploy SAP application components, which include ACS, ERS, your app servers, and databases as well. And then we focus on monitoring tools, which could provide a single pane of glass. And with uh, tools like Amazon CloudWatch, uh, which is a native service used for monitoring your uh, resources running in AWS, and then could be other tools as well, such as Datadog, Splunk, New Relic, and so on. And then you've got operations and compliance management uh, using AWS CloudTrail, AWS Config, or AWS Systems Manager as well. So AWS Config was covered in episode one. So again, I highly recommend to go through episode one if you want to do a deep dive on AWS Config as to how you can use it for your SAP workloads. And then we've got automated administration. Uh, so these are all the areas uh, where we focused on, especially on uh, automation coming to SAP workloads, which have resulted in up to 60% improvement in uh, operating costs. Now, this could be related to AWS config for auditing SAP systems and OS config to basically monitor if there is any drift with your configuration so that you can get notified and then you can take those remediations immediately. Then AWS backin for SAP. And this was something that was covered in yesterday's session. And this is our backup solution, which is integrated with Amazon S3, where you're able to take those SAP HANA backups directly to S3. So no need to provision a local EBS volumes. So that is where you can save on costs. Uh, then our AWS CloudWatch for monitoring SAP. And 
this is where a native services comes into play and they can also integrate with uh, SAP transaction codes uh, such as ST06, ST03. It can even monitor your SAP HANA databases. Uh, and typically behind the scenes, what we are using is Jayco connectivity, Java connectivity to have these solutions enabled and those dashboards visible to you on Amazon CloudWatch. We've also built a solution around simple scheduler for SAP jobs, leveraging uh, AWS uh, native services, and then automated HANA DB patching, auto start st uh, stop of SAP systems uh, using chatbots and then auto scaling for SAP, serverless system refreshes, uh, and then in the end, uh, systems manager for automated maintenance uh, like patching. So I do wanna talk about a couple of uh, solutions that we have uh, that uh, you can look into and see if they're a viable fit for you uh, as a partner or as a customer. So this is uh, basically around start-stop automation. And as you can see from this architecture diagram, uh, we are using all the AWS native services. So you could have 50 systems running, 100 systems running in your AWS environment, and you need to start-stop them because of patching, right? Uh, there's a maintenance activity, and you need to start, and then uh, you need to stop them first, and then eventually, uh, do patching or maintenance activity and then need to start them. Doing it manually will be cumbersome. It will take a lot of time. So that is where uh, AWS Systems Manager gets into play. And you can use Systems Manager to basically start and stop and build those Systems Manager documents, which are nothing but as scripts. Uh, so one customer example that I want to highlight is uh, where we basically uh, patched around 150 plus uh, SAP systems running on EC2 instances across six accounts, uh, which took less than an hour versus six to eight hours if they would have done it manually, right? And another thing, uh, another area where we consider uh, start-stop automation is uh, specifically around your non-production workloads. So there could be a requirement where you can keep them down during non-business uh, hours and use the flexibility of AWS. And that is where uh, your non-production systems could be you know, 50 in number or 30 in number or hundreds of systems, uh, hundreds of non-production systems that you have to shut down if, uh, during non-business hours. So that is where this start-stop automation can come into play. Next is the patch management. I already talked about it uh, of a use case. Uh, and another use case was where a customer implemented this, again, using AWS Systems Manager. I highly recommend everyone to go through the Systems Manager document. Uh, make that as your best friend. It's a very powerful tool which you can leverage uh, in most of the automation scenarios that I'm talking about today. So in the previous scenario as well, Systems Manager was in play. Here as well, for patch management, uh, Systems Manager is in play. And for one customer, we were able to patch their entire HANA landscape, uh, 50 plus HANA databases in less than an hour. Next is the AWS uh, serverless refresh. Uh, so with serverless refresh, Automation customers uh, reduced refresh time from two to three weeks to less than one day with a downtime of uh, fewer than 30 minutes. And here as well, you see all the data, uh, all the AWS native services uh, which are being used AWS step functions, lambdas, parameter store, uh, Amazon DynamoDB to store the state of those. Uh, functions which are being executed uh, using step functions, Amazon. SNS, simple notification service to get those notified whether your refresh was successful or not, or at what stage are you at? And then again, we're using EC2 systems manager service as well. Uh, so this basically allows uh, business functionality rollouts and testing cycles to iterate and move business capabilities into production much quicker. That's one of the advantages. And then uh, uh, this translates basically to more efficient business processes getting rolled out faster and new features and functionality to be realized sooner by the business. And then we've got auto scaling as well. This was one of the questions that was asked uh, yesterday. So I do want to talk about it for a minute or so uh, where you can use our AWS native services 
to auto scale the SAP application servers, right? Uh, now, as you all know, SAP application servers, they work with horizontal scaling versus vertical scaling. I mean, you can create one massive application server to support all your workloads, uh, but that is not a good practice and that is not a good idea. So that is why SAP designed application servers to scale horizontally. And this is where the con concept of AWS auto scaling often comes into play. So this basically enables the enterprises and the business and the basis administrators to automatically detect SAP application server consumption based on SAP specific workload metrics like uh, dialogue work processes, batch work processes, NQ and print work processes as well. So this solution can ad adapt to spikes and dips for concurrent user logins, month end closing, payment runs and a variety of both predictable and unpredictable workloads. All right, and to sum it all up, uh, as we say here in uh, Amazon, there's no compression algorithm for experience. Uh, so we were the first uh, CSP certified SAP to operate in the cloud uh, since 2011. SAP runs majority of their PaaS offerings on AWS largest scalable HANA architecture. So we support uh, OLTP up to 24 terabytes. Uh, which is in a scale-up scenario and 48 terabytes on a scaled-out uh, OLTP scenario. And certified to run broadest range of SAP applications and uh, we've got more than 5,000 customers running on AWS. And when it comes to reliability, uh, one thing I do want to highlight is seven times fewer downtime hours than the next leading uh, cloud service provider. And we've got the largest global infrastructure with 25 regions and 81 availability zones, each with physically separate redundant data centers. Uh, when it comes to cost savings, over 85% of our customers report cost reduction by running SAP on AWS. And customers can also realize immediate cost savings through our migration acceleration incentives or a proposed private pricing agreement as well. All right, uh, and then uh, this is the number one question that I uh, get asked a lot uh, is how do I get started, right? And we've got tons of resources to help you get started. Uh, we saw how Cloud Endure Migration Service automates lift and shift migration. If you're already using HANA, we definitely recommend giving Launch Wizard a try. It makes it super simple for you to deploy systems that are rightly sized and in accordance with AWS best practices in just a few hours. And if you are looking for expert help as you plan and execute your migration, uh, leverage our AWS professional services for SAP. So Raj and um, Sunil that are one of the moderators in the chat, who hopefully you have questions and they're answering, uh, they are from our professional services team. They do these migrations and the, and the provisioning of the infrastructure day in, day out. Uh, and uh, definitely recommend leveraging AWS professional services for SAP. We have a dedicated team for that. Or you can leverage our AWS partners uh, who are also instrumental for so many of our customer success uh, in their migrations on AWS. All right. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining in today. And uh, we really appreciate everyone taking the time out. Uh,